Hey mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I'm out doing my very favorite thing, which is look for mushrooms. The weather has started to cool off a little bit because we're into September. So it's just been a lovely morning and I've been able to pick up a whole lot of species that I want to share with you. So I'm going to start with the edibles. I'm going to move on to some toxic species and then just some things that are pretty interesting and uh, in my estimation are worth getting to know. But before I get started, I want to do a little vision test because as we transition from summer into fall, we start to see uh, black trumpet mushrooms, Craterellus phallax, which is uh, a delightful and delicious mushroom but it is a little bit on the challenging side to uh, spot and locate. So I want to see if uh, you're able to see in this field of vision a uh, single black trumpet mushroom that is popping up. So I'm going to give you two seconds. It is right there. So you can see, oh, I can barely touch him right here. So he's a little, uh, you know, maybe about an inch and a half to two inches tall. Uh, so Craterellus phallax is a fairly common mushroom, but as you can see, they're really challenging to spot. So you have this, uh, you know, mushroom that's sort of a dark brownish black or really dark, you know, color uh, in the center. It is uh, sort of tubular shaped. So the name Craterellus, you oftentimes have mushrooms that are quite cratered in the middle. Uh, if you open it up, you'll also see that it is, you know, really uh, completely hollow inside. The top is a little bit uh, rough, slightly like furry. And then underneath you have a smooth surface that is sort of a, uh, you know, gray black color. And the spore color of this mushroom is sort of a pinkish tan. And so as you can see, you know, it's a, especially in this section, you can see a little bit of this sort of almost pinky tan uh, sort of appearance showing up. But in general, you know, you have a mushroom that looks a little bit like a hole or a wrinkled up leaf on top and then uh, underneath nice and uh, you know reasonably smooth. It's a little bit on the wrinkly side, but it doesn't have gills, it doesn't have pores, it is just a smooth, uh, you know, flat surface. Uh, black trumpet mushrooms are delicious. They have a really nice fruity, sort of earthy uh, flavor and aroma. They also don't lose a lot of mass when you cook them. So a lot of mushrooms lose a ton of uh, mass because they're mostly water when you cook them up. But black trumpets really are just sort of a little, you know, stringy, almost rubbery, but like pleasantly rubbery, uh, you know, treat. You have to collect a lot of them, of course, to, you know, have a lot to eat, but uh, they have so much flavor. They can impart a lot of their essence to all kinds of dishes. I do uh, really enjoy uh, dehydrating these mushrooms and then rehydrating them and then using that rehydrating water in cooking because it takes up a lot of that, uh, you know, pungent sort of earthy flavor and aroma. So Craterellus phallax, that is the species name for uh, the um, black trumpets that are on the eastern, you know, the east coast of the United States. They have Craterellus cornucopoides out west, uh, but, you know, similar in many respects. But uh, Craterellus phallax, very difficult to find. But once you do find them, actually, this is kind of an exception rather than the rule. You'll oftentimes see, uh, you know, cl clusters and colonies of them, enough at least to collect a handful. And really, when it comes to how flavorful they are, sometimes a handful is more than adequate to bring black trumpetiness to whatever it is that you're cooking. I'm going to stop uh, shaking this around so I don't destroy it. I'm going to move on to uh, chanterelle mushrooms. So if you are a uh, seasoned mushroom hunter, this is not going to be news to you, but uh, summertime is chanterelle time in uh, the North Carolina Piedmont, but we do see them into the fall. I think the latest I've ever spotted them was uh, around... Um, around Halloween. But usually, you know, we start to see them taper off pretty dramatically come September. So these are sort of, you know, the final couple rounds of chanterelle's fruitings that I will expect to see this summer. But you have a really beautiful, uh, you know, we have a lot of different species, but many of them are sort of this orangey golden color. Uh, and then they have false gills. So those are not real gills. They're more like uh, forked wrinkles that are on the underneath of this uh, cap. And the cap oftentimes sort of lifts up these uh, false gills run down the stem. Also, if you open the mushroom up, it's got white flesh on the inside that's sort of stringy, like string cheese. The reason I mention that is our uh, lookalikes for this mushroom do not have white flesh on the inside. So that's a really good identification feature. Um, many of them, 
including the ones I'm finding today, have a nice uh, sort of fruity aroma. So it's a little like apricot-y is how people describe it. I just get sort of generic, almost like juicy fruit gum in some instances. So that's, that's what we have going on here. Chanterelles are, uh, you know, abundant. As you can see, I'm gonna go home with a whole bunch of them that I am going to put onto a pizza. Uh, and so, you know, they are not only abundant, but they're also mycorrhizal, meaning that they grow in association with a tree or a plant. So they will come back in the same spot year after year. And so once you have a chanterelle patch or two, it's really quite easy to have enough mushrooms to eat so that you can spend your time uh, exploring and identifying mushrooms that you do not know. Uh, so at least that is my approach. I hit my chanterelle patches when I want to pick up food. I run through the place pretty fast and and I'm on my way to find more interesting and diverse spots. All right, so we've talked about our chanterelles, we've talked about our black trumpets. I also want to introduce you to uh, a species of chicken of the woods. So this is Ladyporus cincinnatus, uh, and some people call it the white chicken of the woods. This is a reasonably sp small specimen of this mushroom. So you can get, uh, you know, mushrooms that are like five pounds plus. I mean, they can get really, really large. And they have this sort of, uh, you know, overlapping um, sort of uh, form to them. And Lady Porus Cincinnatus typically grows from the ground. It is a decomposer. So it decomposes wood, but it's normally growing on wood that is below the surface. And so normally you will find it, and this is not always the case, but often you will find it growing on the ground and it is uh, decomposing wood underneath. So what you have is a polypore mushroom. So underneath you don't have gills, you don't have a sponge, you have just basically a porous layer. Let me see actually if I have my hand lens and see if we can get a shot of this. I'm trying to get better at using my hand lens. Here we go. Okay, so uh, polypores are a really large uh, group of uh, mushroom species. And let's see what we can do here as far as getting a shot of the porous layer. It's not so great. Let's flip it around. All right, let's see what we got here. Okay, so you can kind of see it. Um, it's not great. But, uh, you know, the, the long and short of this is that you have a porous layer underneath uh, instead of, you know, gills or a sponge or something like that. And, uh, oh, and I can see why, the, <laughs> I can see why my hand lens isn't picking it up very well. The pores really haven't opened. This is a very, uh, you know, pretty immature specimen. And so oftentimes when you have a polypore, that porous surface is almost, um, like sandpapery or a little bit rough. This one, again, is super duper smooth. You want to catch Lady Porus Cincinnatus before it gets too mature. So you want the mushroom to be, uh, you know, nice and tender. Uh, it oftentimes has this like really pleasing sort of uh, orangey, you know, pink color uh, with concentric growth zones on it. So that is a really distinctive feature that you'll see on this mushroom is a bright color with different zones of coloration that sort of get lighter around the outer perimeter. And then also, you know, sort of these overlapping uh, leaves, as it were, of a uh, fruiting body. So uh, the trick with Lady Porus uh, is that some people are sensitive to it and get sick as a result of it. I don't think I've ever heard of a toxic event that was any more than, uh, you know, feeling quite ill, but, you know, that it is uh, an allergic reaction that does pass. That said, it can be very uh, unpleasant. And so, you know, if you are trying this mushroom for the first time, I strongly recommend that you try only a small portion and see how it treats you. That said, when Lady Pora Cincinnatus is nice and uh, tender, like this one is, it is a dead ringer for uh, white meat chicken in particular. So it's really, really good from a, you know, like tastiness perspective. I say when it's nice and tender and it's important to harvest it at the right moment, this mushroom can take on these like gnarly chemical flavors uh, if you don't harvest it at the right time. So if you uh, pick the mushroom and you can uh, pull it apart and it's, you know, nice and soft and pliable, uh, then it's usually in good condition to eat. Once you start to find that it is a little bit like dry and stringy and fibrous, oftentimes you will eat it and it has some really like off flavors to it that are again sort of chemically not all that pleasant. 
We do have other uh, species of Ladyporus that are in the southeast. So we have Ladyporus sulfurius, which is, uh, you know, instead of being this sort of um, pinky and white underneath, is a bright sort of pumpkiny orange and then yellow underneath. That mushroom also d can cause people to, well, I think all of the uh, Lady Porous mushrooms can disagree with certain people. So it's just something to be mindful of. But uh, this mushroom is really, um, you know, because it can be so very large, it's really nice to find a good cluster of it. And uh, also, you know, the flavor and the chickeniness of Chicken of the Woods is really hard to understate if you haven't uh, experienced it before. And so sometimes, you know, people will say, oh, this mushroom, it tastes like, um, you know, it tastes like bacon or it tastes like... Gosh, yeah. <laughs> all kinds of things people think mushrooms taste like. Uh, but, you know, Chicken of the Woods really does taste like chicken to an average palate uh, without a lot of seasoning. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to find that and add that to my collecting bag for the day. All right, so we've talked about a couple of edible mushrooms. I want to also introduce you to uh, a, a small chanterelle species. So this is Cantharellus cinnabarinus, also known as the cinnabar red or just red chanterelle. So the chanterelles I've been showing you up until, the, well, the other one that I showed you here, I'll pull out another specimen, are, you know, sort of an orangey color and uh, also, you know, have white flesh on the inside that's nice and firm. What you have with Cantharellus cinnabarinus is a totally, well, not totally, but rather different mushroom overall. So you do have this sort of flowery, uh, you know, appearance typically. It is a much smaller species, so you're always going to find them, you know, like this is a pretty uh, sizable specimen. I've rarely seen them get any larger than, say, a 50 cent piece, so they are pretty small certainly relative to, you know, your larger golden chanterelle species. Uh, but it still has a sort of flowery, uh, you know, indeterminate uh, sort of appearance. So here's a younger one. Uh, you usually have this little like dimple or divot in the middle. Uh, and then also it is this bright sort of, well, cinnabar is, um, I guess, a, a, a mineral. So that is the color that this is. So it's sort of an orangey red color. And it also has forked false gills. And they're kind of deep and blade-like, like they they, you, they don't look as uh, wrinkly and shallow as some of the false gills you'll see on more classic chanterelles. But if you look closely at it, they are uh, forked and they also run down the stem and you can scrape them right off. And so it's, you know, I mean, you kind of destroy the mushroom at that point because it's so thin. But, uh, you know, they're not um, a sort of uh, you know, deep and blade-like snappable type of thing, which a lot of gills often are. Uh, this mushroom on the inside, it does have a sort of a lighter color flesh, but it is not like pure whitish the way that uh, chanterelle, you know, other chanterelles are. And oftentimes you pick up these uh, sort of orangey colors from the surface. And so, you know, occasionally this will be way more uh, like uh, either... Uh, hollow or way more orangey or some combination of the two. So this is an edible mushroom. It's really hard to collect enough of them to, uh, you know, make a good meal out of, but they are really pretty. They also grow in pretty large colonies sometimes. And normally I find them growing, um, especially in like mossy banks and uh, they really like the edge of creeks. And so they're also a really wonderful uh, species for photography because their growth pattern is to grow in these gorgeous little clusters on a uh, nice, you know, um, moss that, that is nice and moist and you have, you know, water droplets and all kinds of, uh, you know, fairy energy. And it's very, very fun for me to find. So I don't normally collect it for the table, again, just because it takes so many of them to make a big meal out of. And I don't find that they have a tremendous amount of flavor. So, you know, if I were uh, trying to feed myself, I would be more interested in collecting that mushroom than I typically am. Um, but, you know, Cantharella cinnabarinus is definitely a beautiful and almost ubiquitous sort of summertime phenomenon. Once you start to look at mushrooms, you will see them really everywhere. 
All right, so we've uh, talked about our edible chanterelle type mushrooms. I also want to spend just a second on this character. This is Areobolitis betula, also known as the shaggy stalked bolete. I bet you can probably guess why. It is called a bolete because it has a spongy undersurface. So that's where the spores come from. It is not, uh, you know, a, um, it's not gills. It's not a, uh, you know, porous layer. It's more, um, you know, a thick tube, uh, like collection of tubes. It's very spongy spongy. So this mushroom is uh, really nice and lemony. It has a good flavor in that respect. And uh, what you have is sort of a, a reddish, uh, sort of dark reddish stem that has yellow shags all over it. And so this is, these are sort of like interlocking, uh, you know, shaggy bits of material over this reddish stem. You also have a highly variable cap, so it can be bright or cherry red. It can be yellow. It varies a lot throughout its life cycle. So this is actually kind of like smack dab in the middle of how, how uh, the shaggy stalked bolete looks as far as uh, color is concerned. The one thing I want to draw your attention to is that it has this really nice yellow rim around the perimeter of the cap, and that's oftentimes a, a good giveaway for not just Areobolitis betula, but other mushrooms in the Areobolitis genus. Uh, so as far as eating this mushroom, my recommendation is to take the cap and just toss it uh, because it's a little bit sticky. There's a whole lot of those, uh, you know, spongy uh, tubes there and, you know, you can dehydrate them and use them and cook, you use them in soup stocks and stuff like that. I'm way too lazy for that kind of thing. So I just take the stems. Sometimes I will, you know, even strip the shags off, but that's not necessary either. And then you can roast them. Um, I do recommend just making sure they get a lot of direct heat. I've known some people who have, uh, you know, say breaded and cooked them and they get, uh, they, they're kind of like fibrous and not all that tasty. So you really want to cook them um, enough to where that, that fibrousness starts to uh, diminish. In terms of what you'll see on the inside of this mushroom, it's not all that remarkable. It's kind of reddish, a little bit on the lighter side. And again, it's got a nice uh, lemony uh, sort of flavor to it. And it can be quite tart. So you want to cook it with, uh, you know, things that are agreeable toward that. I recommend sort of hearty uh, uh, green vegetables. So things like asparagus or green beans are particularly good with Areobolita spatula stems. All right. Another edible mushroom, although not an edible mushroom that I typically enjoy, is uh, the Lactarius indigo species group. So these mushrooms are super fun to find uh, because, of course, they're like bright blue and they also blue, uh, bleed blue juice. So the Lactarius genus is characterized by being cap and stem mushrooms that in one way or another have uh, latex, which is basically a milk or a juice that bleeds from their uh, gills. And so uh, in the case of Lactarius indigo group, it is a very, very dark indigo blue. It is also pretty abundant. So I'm gonna slice this open and you can see you have a tremendous amount of this dark blue pigmentation. It's starting to get all over my knife too. It always looks like I've, um, you know, had a bit of a violent encounter with a Smurf once I've been harvesting these. Uh, but these mushrooms are a little bit on the brittle side and I'm not terribly impressed with the flavor. We do have more than one species. I don't know how to distinguish them. Uh, and, you know, they're, as far as the research and definition of those species, that work is incomplete at this time. But the main giveaway is you, you again, have this mushroom that bleeds blue juice, and it also, uh, you know, normally is nice and circular, and it has this big divot in the middle and concentric growth zones uh, that are around the rim of the cap. And so it can be a very attractive mushroom. It also as with a lot of other lactarius mushrooms, as it gets a little bit older, you start to see patterns and developments of splotches of green uh, coloration. And that is not rot, that is just a color, a pigment that uh, you know emerges as these mushrooms get older. But this one is also another good example of like how abundant that blue juice is. You know, I just smushed it with my thumb and it's just going everywhere. So, you know, Lactarius indigo group is a really uh, enjoyable mushroom also to photograph like these concentric growth zones just are so far out. I love to try to get a good shot that is inclusive of that and also uh, the bluish gills, which sometimes takes some doing because, uh, you know, being able to photograph both the surface uh, and the, uh, you know, fertile 
gills or whatever is on the underneath of a mushroom can be a little bit on the challenging side. But this species is, or species group makes it well worth that effort. All right, uh, let's next talk about uh, our poisonous mushrooms. I think that's sensible. So uh, let's move on to our destroying angel mushrooms. This uh, destroying angel is, uh, you know, we have uh, numerous species on the east coast, the most common of which is called Amanita bisporagera. This one I actually am inclined or tempted to say is uh, a species called Amanita ellipsosperma. And the reason I'm saying that is uh, the base of the stem is nice and pointy. So we have a couple of these uh, highly toxic destroying angel mushrooms that have uh, a pointy base, and that is a distinctive feature for them. So that you have Amanita magnivolaris and also Amanita ellipsosperma are two of the species that I'm aware of that have this uh, pointy uh, vulva. And uh, to talk about vulvas a little bit, uh, this is probably the best way to go about uh, identifying your Amanita genus, but also uh, specifically your really toxic destroying angels and other, you know, really poisonous Amanita mushrooms. So what you have is basically a cup of protective tissue that, uh, you know, is, um, it protects the baby mushroom when it's coming up. So it's a little egg and then the mushroom emerges and it leaves this cup of tissue at the base. In the case of, um, the, uh, destroying angel mushrooms, that cup is, re it's called a vulvate, uh, yeah, a vulvate sac or sacate vul sacate vulva. Uh, anyway, basically it's sac-like. So sometimes, and actually here's a really good example of an Amanita. Uh, this is Amanita ropalopus that I'll talk to you about in a minute. But, uh, you know, the base of this mushroom, it is an Amanita. And so it does have this, uh, you know, unusual growth pattern, but it is definitely not, you know, this distinct, neat little cup of tissue at the base. So this mushroom is, as I mentioned, uh, you know, can be deadly toxic. Uh, the odds that you would die if you ate it and then sought prompt medical treatment are relatively low. But of course, you know, you can have lasting damage, lasting liver damage, lasting kidney damage. So even if one were able to, you know, get treatment and recover, there is a good chance that you'd have uh, long-term, you know, uh, harm from it. So destroying angels in general, cap and stem mushrooms with this, uh, with this saccate vulva at the base. Uh, they're white overall. And so, you know, these mushrooms are some of our most sort of, you know, um, I guess very, very white all over mushrooms. We have a few, but you know, nonetheless, oftentimes if you look at a very bright white Amanita, you are looking at a destroying angel of one kind or another. They also have a partial veil. Uh, this is basically a little skirt on the stalk that's uh, protecting the baby mushroom's gills and then that breaks and leaves. Uh, it's also, um, you know, uh, mycologists call this an annulus, but essentially it's just a little, uh, you know, ring on the stem. Uh, so as you can see, it is totally, uh, you know, safe to handle deadly poisonous mushrooms. I'm not going to allow it to intermingle with any of the things I want to eat. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it is, it is totally safe and fine to handle, collect, study uh, these, you know, deadly poisonous species. And I find it to be really rewarding to do so. The longer I'm into mushrooms, the more Amanitas are becoming uh, challenging for me to ignore uh, just the amount of research and information that can be available about them. So there's a lot of other mushrooms that are just sort of like, we know there are different species represented here and we're just not sure where to go next or the time and the resources aren't adequate to get the work done. But we do have a lot of, uh, you know, interesting Amanita research. I have an Amanitas of North America book that I've been getting a huge kick out of this season so far. So thank you, Britt Bunyard and Jay Justice for authoring that book. Uh, you are very much appreciated, at least in this corner of North Carolina. Okay, so we've talked about our destroying angels. Don't eat those. Uh, let's talk about Amanita ropalopus. This is unfortunately lost the annulus that it had. Uh, so this mushroom, when I collected it, had a very fragile but very, very large uh, sort of uh, felty ring on the stem. So these mushrooms are, uh, you know, in a section called uh, Amanita section lepidella. 
there is a sort of emerging work and my understanding is that a lot of these Amanita section labadella mushrooms are more properly uh, to be called Amanita section roanokensis. But I haven't really made that switch yet because my understanding is still, uh, you know, <laughs> nascent is a really, really charitable way of putting it. Uh, but, you know, these, uh, this section of mushrooms, <clears throat> we have a couple of different species. So the two most common that I find are Amanita ropalopus and Amanita dausipes. And they are sort of a, you know, like creamy color typically. They oftentimes also have uh, sort of fluffy and easily detached warts or uh, almost a sort of powderiness on the cap. Uh, they have nice deep gills that are oftentimes this sort of, you know, again, creamy color. Uh, and then you have a big fat bulbous base. It's a, you know, unusual, uh, well, not unusual, but a distinguishing feature for mushrooms in this uh, species section. Here is a younger one. So you can see you would just have this big old chunk of material at the base. And uh, oftentimes, you know, when it's coming up, you'll see these little uh, recurved, sort of rolls of tissue. Uh, and also when the mushrooms are small, they oftentimes look a bit like a chess piece. And you can see this cuff of tissue right here, which when it breaks will actually become that ring I was talking about, that annulus that is very, very fragile. Amanita ropalopus, besides all of its like visual signatures that you can get to, you know, it's Amanita section Lepidella slash Roanokensis. Uh, is the smell. <laughs> so Amanita ropalopus smells a lot like a peed in pool. So it's very uh, chlorine-y. It has a little bit of this sort of like, uh, yeah, I won't call it meaty, but it's more of a, um, I don't know, protein sort of aroma. But most of what you're getting off of Amanita ropalopus is uh, kind of a chlorine smell. And so that's oftentimes how I kind of narrow it down, uh, you know, to what it is. You can certainly learn a whole lot more about this entire section of mushrooms and distinguishing between them on uh, amanitaceae.org and other Amanita resources on the internet. Uh, but, you know, for my purposes, I'm like, if it smells a lot like chlorine and it has those other features, I'm going in the direction of Amanita ropalopus. Amanita dalcipe is a lot of the same sort of characteristics. It also has some discoloration, so it's kind of a, you know, like brownish red um, can start to appear on it. And it has sort of a, a, a real like gross meaty smell. So people describe it like, um, you know, I describe it like a ham sandwich that's been sitting out in the sun for a while. So it's this like cured meat aroma. It's very weird. Uh, you know, these mushrooms, I think it goes without saying, are not considered edible. A lot of them, their toxicity is unknown. Uh, and I suspect that it would make you, like, re probably really sick to eat them, but I, I don't know uh, for a fact. So that's uh, Amanita ropalopus. Always enjoy seeing it because it is so large. You know, the, the one that I showed you is actually, I, I would consider to be a medium size. Sometimes these mushrooms can be, you know, the size of a dinner plate. It's just like, you're ludicrous and you smell to high heaven and I'm going to get pictures of you. Uh, oftentimes when I'm taking pictures of these mushrooms, that's when I get chigger bites as well. I don't know what it is, but um, when I get attacked by chiggers, it's almost always when I am looking at uh, Amanita ropalopus or Am Amanita dousey face. All right, so we've talked about our toxic mushrooms. Oh, I have one other edible mushroom I wanna show you, sorry. Uh, this is Russula crustosa group, also known as the cracked cap Russula. You could probably see why. So it has this nice sort of cracked pattern on it. Uh, you usually see sort of a green, gray to pink uh, colored mushroom and variations of that coloration in between. And then this lighter spot in the middle. You have a mushroom underneath that, like other russulas, is, uh, you know, white gills, very, very brittle, and no ring on the stem, no real features on the stem whatsoever. It's just sort of, it's a mushroom. It popped right up. And uh, so, you know, in identifying russula mushrooms, one thing that you can do is snap them open, and they basically snap open really easily. They're very brittle, like a piece of chalk. And so that's a really good way to identify them. But uh, there are, again, numerous species of them, and this is a very lightly colored one. But this cracked appearance is really quite uh, distinctive for a couple of our good uh, edible Russula mushrooms. So we have Russula crustosa group, 
We also have Russula parvovirescens, which is the blue-green cat, cracked cat Russula, or quilted Russula, which is my preference because it's just fewer syllables. And uh, that one is a really beautiful blue-green color. So if you find one that's sort of like kind of off green, but more gray and maybe a little bit of pink, you're looking at Russula crustosa group. But again, that cracked cap appearance with a brittle mushroom uh, is, is oftentimes um, that. So uh, let's see, let's proceed onward to, uh, well, since we're talking about Russellas, I'm going to talk about a giant red Russella. Uh, you know, red Russellas are super duper common. There's a lot of different species of them. And, you know, it's very, very difficult to distinguish between Russellas. Sometimes impossible, sometimes they're not even, you know, named. Uh, but they're really fun to find because they're very colorful and sometimes they can get very big. But as I was just showing you with, uh, you know, the, uh, am or the, the Russula crustosa group, they are just very, very brittle, which makes them a lot of fun to find because they're colorful and they smash and just explode on impact. This is one of my favorite things. I've done, on, done it on the channel more times than I can count, but I always get a kick out of finding Russellas because they're often colorful and they have this just gorgeous smashing reaction. Uh, they're also very popular with wildlife, so uh, I see a lot of times they're just scattered all over the forest floor, and that is in part because uh, squirrels just love their russulas. Uh, russulas that are not spicy and, and hot, like in a cayenne pepper sense, can be eaten. I typically don't eat a lot of russula just because I don't uh, need to. I mean, there's only so many mushrooms I want to eat, and I'm typically, you know, my my cup overfloweth by the time I'm done in the chanterelle patch. But nonetheless, russulas are always uh, just a treat to find. All right, so let's uh, talk about three yellow mushrooms and one purple one. Uh, so let's start with the purple one because purple is a uh, a fun color. So this is a uh, Tylopil uh, Tylopilus plumio violaceus. So this is a purple mushroom that is very, very bitter. Uh, you know, certainly couldn't be eaten, but uh, the Tylopilus genus, it has a couple of edible species, but most of them are very bitter and kind of lilac or purple colored. Uh, you know, plumio violaceus is probably one of the purplest of them. When I open up the mushroom, it looks like we have some visitors on the inside. You know, the purple is, is only on the outside. As you can see, it's got white flesh on the inside. And then underneath you have a uh, very thin white uh, um, spongy layer. So this is a bolete type mushroom. And it's a little difficult to see here because that layer is so thin. Uh, nonetheless, you know, it is a, a white spongy layer and, uh, you know, it, it basically, in terms of plumia violaceus, it's purple on top and its stem is purple. And a lot of times you'll have uh, tylopilus that are sort of like a purpley brown cap and then, uh, you know, sort of a brownish uh, stem. And so, you know, plumio violaceus is just more purpley and a little smaller than many of your other tylopilus mushrooms. So I enjoy finding them because of their color. Uh, again, way, way too bitter to be eaten. Speaking of bitter, let's talk about uh, uh, <laughs> Redibolitis ornatopes. So this is known as the ornate stemmed bolete. Uh, this particular one, let's give it a try. Wow. Yeah. Very, very bitter. So uh, it's always safe to do that if you want to taste test a mushroom for the sake of identification. Oftentimes not necessary, but it's always, you know, fine to like chew a little bit and spill it, spit it out to figure out what it tastes like. So, uh, you know, Retiboletus ornatopes gets its name, the or ornate stem bolete, because it has a very prominent reticulation. And so that is basically this sort of fishnet, uh, you know, overlay on the flesh itself. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of interlocking. Let's see if we can get a slightly, oh yeah, there we go. So it's sort of a, you know, netted uh, appearance and that runs almost all the way down the stem. And so in the case of a lot of mushrooms that have reticulation, that's that uh, sort of feature, uh, it is only, you know, at the top of the mushroom stem. But in the case of Redibolitis ornatipes, what you have is reticulation that goes all the way down the stem and also, uh, you know, sort of a bright orange all over mushroom. As they mature, sometimes you start to see like sort of a silvery gray start to, you know, crop up. 
but nonetheless like overall you have uh you know yellow sponge underneath and you have yellow cap and yellow stem with reticulation or um yeah, Retiboletus ornatipes. And Retiboletus is one of the many uh, genera of the spongy bottom bolete type mushrooms. I remember Retiboletus because it has reticulation and abundant reticulation in the case of uh, ornatopes. All right. Uh, I am also going to tell you about uh, Russula flavida. So <clears throat> this is a brightly colored Russula mushroom that can really mess you up in a chanterelle patch because from the top it has a nice chanterelle appearance to it. But when you flip it over, what you have is a Russula mushroom. So it's a brittle mushroom with white gills. And then it has this really nice yellow stem. So a lot of your Russula mushrooms have, you know, they're brightly colored, but they have uh, a white stem. And so this yellow stem of Russula flavida is reasonably distinctive. Uh, so, you know, again, it's very, very brittle and crumbly, uh, but, you know, that uh, bright orangey yellow and then uh, more of a yellowy stem um, is distinctive for Russula flavida. And the flav, the F-L-A-V, that's usually in reference to yellow, that's what it means. And so, uh, you know, you have Russula flavida, you have Amanita flavaconia, which is yellow patches, you have, gosh, I think there's Cantharellus flavolateritis. Uh, I'm mispronouncing it, but anyway, it's a yellowy, uh, smooth chanterelle. So the, that word root appears so frequently in mushroom names is a really helpful one to know. Actually, really, any uh, sort of, you know, Latin or Greek root for a color or foot <laughs> or, uh, you know, the <laughs> foot, I say, because a lot of mushrooms that have like... Um, you know, uh, a particular sort of feature at their base, you'll have uh, tipes uh, as the, you know, that that's foot, I think. Anyway, see, now I'm, now I'm really screwing up. But uh, long and short, uh, you have Russula flavida is one of the, uh, you know, really pretty mushrooms that uses that uh, color word root. But again, you know, things that are related to body parts and things that are related to color are oftentimes helpful. So head and foot, and then uh, all the colors of the rainbow, that gives you a good foundation of some of the words you want to learn. All right, um, I'm going to finish off by talking very briefly about uh, some Romaria mushrooms. So these are a couple of different species of coral mushrooms. Oop. And uh, there are a lot of different types of them, and they're very difficult to identify to species. And I usually am just like, meh, it's a, it's a Romaria, and I'm happy enough with that. They're a fleshy mushroom that grows on the ground. Um, some of them are, are edible. I don't eat them, but that's, again, a laziness thing, not uh, an aversion thing. I guess some of them can uh, be laxative and cause you to get the poops. And so that has also deterred me to one degree or another. But that is one of those things that, like, I've never talked to anyone who's actually had that experience. It's documented in the books, but I don't know how widespread or common that effect is. Uh, but anyway, you know, you have mushrooms that grow on the ground that look very much like they belong on the uh, ocean floor. So they have these, you know, nice little coral type branches coming up from a nice stumpy fleshy stem. You have some other uh, genera that look a lot like coral as well. So you have Artemises. You also have uh, Clavaria and Clavulina. Those mushrooms can look very coral-like, but they tend to be a lot more uh, sort of like woody or brittle or stringy, whereas Romeria tends to be larger in general, certainly fleshy and oftentimes more brightly colored because uh, Clavulina is oftentimes sort of like dingy white colors or gray colors, things like that. Again, that is not a hard and fast rule. Those are just things to be aware of if you're interested in, you know, getting into identifying mushrooms that look something like sea life. Uh, and so I think that's all I've got to share. That's a, actually a whole lot of talking. I've gone on for quite some while. I hope you're having a great mushroom season. I'm really delighted and relieved. We've had a little bit of cooler weather because that gives me uh, more tolerance to be out in the woods for longer periods of time to collect a greater number of specimens that give me so very much joy. Take the best of care. Talk to you soon.